Hi everyone, I'm really delighted to welcome Catherine Johnson who will be keynoting for us today. Um, I'm sure that most of you are very familiar with Catherine's work, which is very broad ranging, um, but focuses largely on issues to do with mental health and sexualities, but also more recently with around embodiment um, and visual methods. Um, Catherine has a new book coming out in November that you might want to be aware of on sexuality and the psychosocial. So we're really looking forward to that. And I've had a sneak preview of it as well. So I strongly recommend it. Um, and yeah, I'll just hand over to you because you will talk better about what you have to say than I do. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, can I just say it's wonderful to be here. In fact, Powers was my second conference I went to when I was with my PhD. And it's interesting talking about themes coming around again because actually I was looking at one of them in my PhD and I'm going to kind of pull out some of that today. But um, it was a wonderful conference, it was in Dundee. I've got to train back with those <laughs> in London. And um, so it's, it's lovely to be back here and it's a great honour to be invited to, uh, to come and talk today. Okay, so I am I'm talking around the theme of bodies and embodiment. And I'm going to talk through um, notions of queer bodies um, using two examples. So I'm going to try to think through these, and actually, some of these are quite, I suppose, they're new and old ideas that I'm trying to work through. So um, I'm going to be looking at notions of fat bodies uh, in relation to things like obesity, but I'm also going to be looking at transgender bodies, which is basically where I did my original research um, back in the late 1990s. So um, just to start then, I'm using the term queer bodies to think about bodies that are kind of non-normative or anti-normative in many ways. And remember, queer theory is about anti-normativity, it is anti-identity. So queer bodies, the bodies that are anti-normative and that they challenge the conventional norms around gender, sexuality, race, class, ability, disability, appearance, etc, etc. Now in my own work I have tended to focus on gender and sexuality, so that's sort of where I'm going to keep going today. Okay, so to think about queer bodies in the context of gender theory is not new. Uh, we can find uh, examples, um, you know, through, uh, through kind of many decades of feminist theory. But I want to kind of take us back to thinking about Butler's ideas around drag and the performativity of gender. Now, performativity has stayed a central concept to post-structuralist approaches to gender, sexuality, and beyond. So the idea that you know gender is something that we do, uh, you know, that this kind of, it's not a just it's not a performance, but there's a performativity. The ideas around it become naturalised over time, uh, and you know that's kind of what Butler's arguments were. Um, it's very much associated with the cultural turn um, and the critique of representations by analysis of power and language. So of course we find these ideas. Uh, you know, regularly represented within uh, critical feminist psychology, particularly in terms of the theory we use, post-structuralism, and the methods we use, discourse analysis, uh, which are you know, staples of the way that critical psychologists will engage with our research. Okay, now when I was doing my PhD, I was looking at uh, transgender and the process of transitioning, and this raised some questions for me about the uh, I suppose how far we can stretch post-structuralism and how far we can stretch <coughs> discourse analysis. So trans transgender raises questions really in that kind of context. But transgender was used as a as a kind of queer trope. So um, in so post Butler, the notion of transgender was used as an example about how we can queer bodies, how you know bodies can kind of move across transgress gender lines, etc. Now this person here is Buck Angel. I don't know if any of you know Buck Angel. Buck Angel is um, a trans man. He's an advocate. He's also a porn star, and um, and he's known um, kind of broadly um, as the man with the pussy. Okay. Uh, he was also the first trans man to ever star <coughs> in an all gay male porn film. Okay, as the man. So of course here we can think about the celebrations of crossings of lines of gender and sexuality. <coughs> now he's he is he is very well known in kind of you know queer culture. Um, and this person uh, over here on your left is Stuart Warwick, who is uh, a singer, songwriter from Brighton, my hometown, who um, wrote an ode to Duck Angel uh, called The Man with the Pussy. Okay, it's a rather beautiful song, and I want to kind of uh, let you kind of hear this. Now, this is he in terms of when he this this video that I'm going to show you. It also stars David Hoyle. Anyone know David 
Hoyle was David Hoyle was the divine. David David Hoyle is an anti drag queen, um, and um, he calls the um, as you say, LGBT community the biggest suicide pact in history um, because he's been very critical about engagements with consumerism and you know, materialistic cultures, etc. Uh, so David Hoyle here is getting ready for his show in Brighton, and I just want to to kind of show this to basically to to kind of get us to start thinking about the kind of transgressions of gender and moving across gender lines. So, oops, Sort of different interpretations of the work, the idea that we can become anybody we want to become. 
Um, and it was also about uh, criticised for a failure to engage with the materiality of the body or how bodies matter, as, as uh, she tried to address in the subsequent book. Um, but these debates within feminist theory about materiality or new materialisms and the limits of post-structuralism are ongoing. They, I mean, we're, they're with us all the time. So what's the place of post-structuralism in, in these kinds of debates around the body? Okay, um, I think in the last kind of decade we've seen this within feminist theory particularly in, in relation to an increased attention to, to notions around affect, feeling and ontology. Uh, you know, across the social sciences and humanities. So we're, we're undergoing what's being called now a turn to affect or a turn to ontology, uh, as opposed to the cultural turn and the turn to kind of epistemology, forms of knowing, language, representation. <coughs> now, I trace this back uh, to the influence of um, Eve Sedgwick. Now, other people trace it back to other people, but for me, the influence has come about from Eve Sedgwick's work. Um, she wrote the paper in 1995, which was called Paranoid Reading and Reparative Reading, or you're also paranoid, you probably think this essay is about you. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lovely, lovely title. It was published, as I said, in 1995 in Critical Inquiry, um, and then it was subsequently published in the Sylvan Tompkins Reader, and then later in her book, Touching Feeling. Now, what Cedric was trying to do was to try to, she was trying to kind of break out with this notion uh, that she saw as associated with performativity, post-structuralist critique about the idea that we're always working between these binaries. So whether these binaries are essentialism or inessentialism, uh, for her in this paper she was drawing on Melanie Klein's work about, about you know, how we get these certain splits and the splits between what's good and what's bad. So, so in this kind of sense, inessentialism is good, essentialism is bad. Yeah? And she's trying to kind of move beyond that type of thinking. <coughs> Um, now, what this kind of does is it, it kind of turns our attention to the use of multiple theories in relation to thinking about embodiment. So we can't really just think about embodiment through post structuralism, but there's also like we need to look at psychoanalysis, we need to look at biology, neuroscience. Um, uh, neuroscience is having a particular uh, impact in relation to affect theory. Um, and, and Cedric's argument was that we need to engage with these within a reparative framework, so not just trash them because it's easy to trash them. We know how to do that. We have those critical tools to trash them. We need to engage with them in a reparative way, uh, uh, and even if this does risk certain forms of perception. Um, she also says that it means we need to develop new methods of interpretation um, uh, and move beyond a particular hermeneutics of suspicion. Okay? So, um, I mean, I'm not going to talk much about methods today, but it is something that does really interest me about how do we have methods which can engage with embodiment. And I think it's, I think it's always kind of been there through, through my work, but, um, but I'm particularly interested in that how do we have methods which can engage with affect. Um, because we, we can't really catch it in the jar. And actually, if you're trying to have that, you can't really analyse affect through text either. So. Mm -hmm. <coughs> okay, so the first place that I picked up on Cedric's work was actually in relation to understanding of trans embodiment. And, um, and this was actually about a critique and a rejection of the notion of trans uh, people being used as a queer trope within feminist debates about, about you know, the performative to the body uh, or about essentialist claims about what really is a man or a woman. Okay, so, so it was a kind of a, a turn to, the, to trying to understand what is trans embodiment. And this is particularly in the work of Jane Prosser. Now, Jay Prosser talked about the politics of home and the politics of not being simply male or female. Um, he, he was rejecting the kind of pathologizations of trans, but he didn't think that in the way that he thought that Butler's work had inspired this uptake of basically trans as a trope to either defend or challenge a genesis. And actually, in using his notions about the politics of home, he was trying to theorise and wonder about what does it feel like to be in one skin. You know, a sense of yourself, a kind of internal sense of a body schema. And, and he was doing that in the way, influenced by Cedric, in a way that risked the centralist thing, yeah? or sort of critiques of centralism. So this kind of led to questions about, so how do trans subjects experience themselves, and what are the politics of trans embodiment? Okay, I just want to very briefly give some definitions of embodiment. It's quite, it's quite interesting, you look it up in the dictionary, embodiment, the act of embodying or state of being embodied. <laughs> Uh, something or someone who embodies in their spirit or principle idea. Okay, so embodying or embodied, well, this means to give concrete form to an abstract concept or to provide a body or make corporeal. And corporeal, 
as an adjective means to describe the nature of the physical body or of materiality or something that's tangible, yeah? something we can kind of touch, feel, etc. Okay, so towards the politics of embodiment. Um, well, I, mean, I want to point out why I'm using the term politics and why I'm just saying towards embodiment or theorising embodiment. Um, I think the politics of embodiment is, is absolutely crucial because we need to think about the way that um, there are material realities to how we are differently embodied. And we have different possibilities and access to different forms of embodiment. And, um, and the, but also, politics is about how we do our research in relation to embodiment. And it's in politics in terms of how we actually do feminist research, theoretically and methodologically. And there are some really big political debates there in relation to what's the role of biology, what's the role of neuroscience, etc. etc. Okay? These kind of debates across post-structuralism. Okay. So, what are the politics of transgender embodiment? This is an exhaustive list. These are some of the things which frame transgender embodiment. Okay, so we've got the, the politics of diagnostic practices, the, the politics of gatekeeper uh, deciding who gets to transition, who doesn't get to transition. Uh, the po politics over do you have agency over your own body, or does someone else decide you know, how, how you're, whether you can transform or not transform, etc. We have politics um, about access to healthcare. Uh, and this is socio-economic access. I mean, in the UK, people are able to transition through the NHS, although it's um, uh, a very hard fought for privilege. It can take many, many years. In the US, of course, private medical care. These are, you know, these are things that basically healthcare access is dependent on your socio-economic privileges. We also have politics of biomedical innovation. So some people would say that actually. Transgender subjectivity has only come into being because of biomedical innovation, because of um, surgical um, techniques, because of greater understanding of hormones and the roles that hormones can have in transforming the physical body. Uh, but we also have the politics of passing. Um, and this is one which I think you know, is a really kind of tricky area. So, so for someone to pass as male or as female, that, we, you know, that undoes trans subjectivity. Yeah? So, so for someone to to be to be um, read as male or female, and but also what happens though is if people don't out themselves as trans, they can then be experiencing all kinds of forms of transphobia in a kind of very kind of in a way that will make them feel incredibly uncomfortable. But then what's you know what's why do they have to out themselves in every situation so that people are transphobic, etc. So, so the kind of, there's lots of kind of debates about whether or not people should pass, you know, whether that undoes trans subjectivity, whether that does uphold normative assumptions around gender, etc. And then, you know, who gets to transgress gender norms? And then also, of course, the politics of if you don't pass and, and the implications for personal safety, etc., physical attacks, violence. Mm -hmm. So there's a, there's a real kind of um, debate around about politics of passing. Okay, so how do we theorise trans embodiment? Well, in my own work, I've used <coughs> terms like embodied subjectivity. I know it's tautological, um, but it was trying to make a point about it being a critical engagement with post-structuralism. So, there's lots of people talk about subjectivity, but through a post-structuralist framework, I was trying to kind of make, make the kind of embodied bit, of course, subjectivity is embodied, have it not be. But um, also, the use of phenomenology um, and psychoanalysis we can use to enrich theory and method. Um, notions of being in the world, you know, those sorts of concepts and phenomenology. Um, I argued that gender transition is an ongoing process of both becoming and unbecoming male or female. So for people who are transitioning, there's a, it's, it's a, we have this kind of interrelationship between biology, between cultural practices of gender performance. So, and, and this might be a movement towards something, but there's also an undoing of the way that previous biologies and previous cultural practices of deportment kind of mark out the body. So this requires this transdisciplinary engagement, I think, with biology, with hormones, um, with psychology and with culture. But not just thinking that hormones, you know, hormones don't just change the body, our kind of experiences can also change hormones as well. So, you know, but we have to have a kind of interrelationship where we don't just ignore them because we don't like them. Okay? <laughs> So the nuances then of 
gender identifications in Bollywood um, and intersections with health norms need very careful, I think, uh, consideration in the context of transgender. Okay, and now, uh, this is what I'm kind of getting into. What I want to talk in here about. I'll, I'll kind of focus on health. So, taking hormones over a lifetime can make uh, you know amazing transformations to the body and yeah, to the transgender body. But also, those hormones have other implications in relation to bodily function, the, the function of the liver, for example, all these sorts of things. So, so there, there are certain things that kind of um, the, the, the kind of notions of queer bodies and gender performativity don't really engage with in terms of the material reality of what it is to be trans and to take hormones, you know, over long periods of time. There are also other things that we need to consider in relation to things like. Um, Health checks, for example. So a health check could be a real opportunity for queer and gender norms. So if a trans woman goes to the doctor and asks for a prostate check, you know, that, that can really kind of unsettle our understanding norms and understandings of, of kind of gender. But if it's, um, it depends on how that, that experience is experienced by that person in that doctor's kind of surgery at that time. So in this kind of sense, I think, you know, we have to think about that there's, there's always the possibility of transgressing and questioning the naturalness of gender identification by the bodies. But there's also the possibility of undoing the gender embodiment. So some of us, you know, sense of themselves um, as being gendered as a, you know, as a trans man might be undone by having to have a cervical smear. Yeah? Mm -hmm. so, so we have to kind of have some kind of sensitivity to these nuances. So it's not just about performativity celebration, there are some real kind of embodied impacts uh, which can be experienced in more difficult ways. Okay, so how might feminist psychology benefit from an expanded engagement with a queer perspective then, whilst maintaining attention to embodiment? Okay, queer is tricky for psychology uh, and, and I'll, I'll go over that um, a little bit, but I want to, to try to pull some of these things out. I want to talk a little bit more about another form of embodiment that's very widely represented, which is notions of uh, the fat body, okay? Notions of obesity. This is uh, Charlotte Cooper, who is an um, uh, academic and fat activist that is actually taken from her blog called Obesity in Time. Okay, I, I, I love this picture, I think it's absolutely brilliant. So, um, Okay, so I want to kind of talk a bit about fat studies and, and how this also ties to kind of unsettle, or I think, makes us have to think about how do we unsettle our kind of engagements in relation to the politics of embodiment, um, just outside of the post framework. Okay, so fat studies has really grown in popularity. Um, in fact, it kind of emerged in a very similar Alongside interests around transgender, actually, um, uh, conferences on body modifications and somatechnics, um, people in Sydney who are the people I've kind of most engaged with in this field of research. Um, so, but it's, it's, it has become very popular in the last kind of uh, 10 years. And I think it's an area which really weds feminist and crit queer critiques together, okay, to try to rethink, as Sam Murray says, dominant ideas about fat bodies as they are constructed in relation to health and pathology, gender and bodily aesthetics, and also intersectional <coughs> identities and beyond. So, you know, like who, you know, who, the, the kind of, the who gets kind of labelled in more pathologised ways, etc. The, the kind of way it's very difficult to uncouple notions of uh, looking good from kind of understandings of gender, etc. Okay. So again, there's a whole range of cultural representations of obesity. We're surrounded by it all the time. Uh, there's a couple that I thought I would uh, show you. Um, but most of these really are about the shame and humiliation in relation to kind of weight. Yeah? Um, uh, fat Fighters, uh, a comedy clip from Little Britain, does anyone remember this? And um, uh, Marjorie, who was. Um, ran the um, clinic, not ran the, the kind of weight watchers type evening. But Marjorie, who was uh, also overweight, but would always be very, very kind of derogatory to the people who attended the events. Yeah. Okay. I, I will show you a short clip of this. I, I actually find this quite difficult to watch, and, and, um, and not particularly funny. But I thought I would show you because it sort of seems as humour. I think it does say something culturally. But, um, One of many yeah, diet anyway. classes happening today all over America. 
where there are now huge numbers of obese people or greedy fat slums. about causality, about responsibility, 
uh, who's responsible about degeneracy, um, and as uh, uh, Rod says, the imaginable and pragmatic logic of cure. Now, these, you know, these are very familiar things in relation to the um, AIDS epidemic. Yeah? They're, they're the same sorts of things that, that go, kind of go on. Now, you know, if you can see this picture, this is called the weight of the nation. I mean, I mean, anyone who can do discourse analysis, this is easy, you know. It's like, you know, the, you know to win, we have to lose. And it's that, you know, we've got all kinds of things like nation building going on here, you know. It's all to do with the broader kind of concepts of consumerism and capitalism, and somehow this is seen as like one of the, the kind of failures and downsides of our kind of consumerist society. Okay, but um, there is a problem though that requires more than paranoid readings and deconstructions of representations of like weight and healthism. Okay, we can't just deconstruct these things. Yeah, we do have to kind of engage with some of the kind of materiality of those problems. Now, Sam Murray. The reason I really like Sam Murray's work is because she's sort of she's sort of doing both of this. Yeah, so her objective study is both constructions of fatness and obesity. In particular, she's looked at in health psychology, um, but also documenting that alongside her own kind of progressive health problems she had as a result of being uh, obese, and then about eventually deciding to have a laparoscopic gastro band implant fitted. Okay, and and I think what's what I think it's really interesting work because what we see is the lived inconsistency, the way that we are always caught in these traps of these kind of inconsistencies. Okay. Now, you know, in, you know, in her kind of analysis, she says that fatness as a lack of individual control is widely found in health psychology literature. She does an analysis of Jane Ogden's work in particular, uh, and where it's the bariatric surgery is constructed as a means of re-establishing a sense of control. So it's like, so it's a physical intervention, but it's kind of constructed as some kind of psychological intervention because it constructs someone's ability to have control again over their eating. And of course the control over eating is because you physically can't eat because the portion size has to be so tiny once you've had um, the gastric band. So Murray argues that surgery merely resituates central aspects of one's existence and demands this, an ongoing physiological and psychic exercise of control thereby disturbingly reaffirming the fat bodies, the fat bodies are fundamentally out of control. Okay, so it really kind of constitutes fat bodies as out of control. Okay, but if we queer this notion of fat embodiment, it can help us draw attention to and challenge these normative consequences of such interventions. Um, uh, uh, particularly if we want to offer alternative conceptions of health beyond moralising and normalising discourse. Uh, and, and, and much of our kind of engagements with health are, I would say, quite unexamined in, in, the, sense, in the way that we examine notions of gender, sexuality, etc. with much more kind of criticality. So some of our kind of, kind of conceptions of health are less examined in the sense of trying to understand how they also fit within a normalising and moralising discourse. Okay, but we also need to know to theorise how bodies transform and embodiment shifts both against and with norms of gender and health in this kind of early process. And I think this is what with Sam Murray, when she had so she had a gastric band put in and then she lost a lot of weight. Okay. And so this is um, kind of an image, but she lost a lot of weight, she got a lot of compliments. Uh, she was complimented on her appetite being much smaller. <laughs> you know, so there's all this kind of stuff though which is associated with the norms of gender. So so you know, so that kind of that kind of thing. So so this is what I really like her work because she's just talking about how you get caught up in, in these kinds of um, dynamics. So she reflects on the challenges this then had for her feminist commitment to diversity and body shape and size. So you know, she had really quite profound health problems. She had um, sort of diagnoses in relation to polycystic ovary, which had, a, had, had an impact on, on her weight. So, you know, and, and yet, you know, then she's engaging with something which is an intervention to help with health, but then it kind of, kind of draws you right back into these kind of feminine <coughs> like, discourses that you want to critique from a feminist perspective. So yes, yeah, so she was looking at the challenges of feminist commitment to diversity in bodies of shape and size and the difficulty in resisting the pressure of normative body aesthetics that prize the slim female body above, whether she said above or else. 
So she argues that it's actually impossible to separate our medical constructions of the healthy female body from the cultural standard of the attractive one. You know, they, they become really entwined. So this, I would say, implies that we need a, both a feminist and a queer engagement with health and healthism, um, as well as the politics of gendered embodiment. So we need to also engage with, the, kind of, with our notions of health as much as with our gendered embodiment. Okay, so queering health. Can we queer health? Um, this book, very controversial title, Against Health. It's quite, I mean, I love it. It's to say, well, I'm against health. I mean, it's quite, it's quite a difficult thing to say. It's a bit like saying, I'm against equality. You know, like you just, this doesn't kind of roll off the tongue very well. Yeah. But, um, but what they're arguing in the book, though, is that actually health as a concept, as a norm, as a set of body practices, its, it's ideological work is often rendered invisible uh, by the assumption that it is a monolithic universal good. Uh, okay, so, so this is what they're trying to, to draw attention to is the, the kind of um, how health has become a new form of morality. Yeah. So, so I try to kind of engage with that. Now, of course, nobody, if someone's got some, if someone's ill, no one's going to say, don't go to the doctor because I'm against, you know, health. But it's about actually having this kind of critical engagement with the kind of ideological values that um, notions of health are trying to serve. Okay, so can we queer health in psychology? Or are queer theories too radical? And I think this is a very interesting question, and I, I had to say I moved back and forwards with it myself. Um, um, queer, the principles of queer are anti-identity and anti-normativity, and psychology as a discipline looks at the individual identities and norms of human behaviour. So it's quite difficult in some ways to kind of queer psychology without losing psychology altogether. Yeah? Um, now, Lisa Derming and Robert uh, Gillett have said that um, they kind of said that even in critical psychology, we're not actually very good at looking at these kind of concepts of things like health, queer and national health. And they say, is critical psychology a broadly liberal one that would seek to enlarge the range of what can be incorporated into the canon of acceptable healthy practices rather than being labelled pathological? Or instead, might we seek to reject the distinction altogether? Um, a more radical and queer gesture of epistemological deconstruction. So we're all familiar with it, aren't we? We have like the abnormal psychology, yeah, which I'm sure no one in this room would ever have a module called abnormal psychology uh, anymore. Um, but of course, abnormal is against the norm. You know, so what do we call it? We say mental health instead, don't we? So uh, you know, but what is this distinction then between mental health and stress? Where where are the lines? Yeah. Okay. Uh, where's the where's the where, where do we want to kind of actually tackle that kind of line? Um, or do we just want to incorporate more things inside and say, no, that's not that much, that's just another form of behaviour or something. Okay, um, using examples, they say that critical psychologists promote reinterpretations of problematised health related behaviours like sadomasochism, unsafe sex, or overeating, but only so far as they reconceptualise them from pathology to individual therapeutic value. Okay, so, so that's, it. that's their point. What so, how is health constituted then? Well, I think it's a good question to ask. How is, what do we mean when we say health? Is it a biological condition? Um, is it the availability to work? Um, and this is um, what David Harvey says, that actually the definitions of sickness in capitalist society is not being able to work. You can get signed off sick because you can't work. So, so is health being able to work? Or is it a scene of longevity? So this is from the uh, So you know, is it just about being living a long life, surviving until we're 85 or 95 or 105 or 120? What they're sort of predicting is a scene of, of the kind of population's health. Um, questioning how health itself is constituted is central to queer commentaries. Um, so I want to kind of think about that in this in this context of things around um, obesity. Now obesity is often seen, as we saw in the, the clip from Fat Fighters, you know, it's seen that it's a personal failure, but it's also seen as some kind of psychological personal failure. Yeah? Self medicalisation, um, you know, the kind of you know the idea that we're doing it to comfort ourselves, you know, those sorts of things. And it's also constructed as a form of kind of slow death, yeah, eating yourself to death. Or drinking yourself to death. How consumption is, you know, kind of put in those sorts of ways. Now, slow death is a is a 
concept I've come across really in the work of Lauren Blotz, which I really like, and I think it's really helpful in this kind of thing about how we think about clear relations for health. Now, Lauren Blotz says that slow death, she uses it to refer to the physical wearing out of a population in a way that points to its deterioration as a defining condition of its experience and historical existence. Okay, so we're not trying to achieve health, we are actually living a slow death, okay? And that is not our kind of thing. And I love that. I, I, mean, I really, I really kind of the twisting and queering of that kind of round. And you know, like we've all sort of, in, certain, in a kind of sense, we've fallen for this notion that this, there's this health, this future kind of drive in relation to health. But actually, the, the conditions of the population is actually this slow deterioration, especially once you get past water. Um, okay. So slow death draws attention to long-term problems of embodiment within capitalism, in the zoning of the everyday, in the work of getting through, uh, and the obstacles to physical and mental flourishing. So now she says to address these, we require other frames than things like eating is a disease of the weir or an addiction or a compulsion. We need other frames we're thinking about for elaborating the context of doing, being, and thriving. So we need a much more kind of critical engagement in this kind of sense of seeing it as something to do with our own individual, personal failings and that kind of way. But what she argues then is that the scene of slow death is a condition of being worn out by the activity of reproducing life. There's a melancholy in her work which I also find quite attractive. But it's, like, but it's this kind of sense that, um, you know, that we're constantly pursuing, we constantly think if we just work a little bit harder, we'll get a little bit easier, yeah? And we've all fallen for this <laughs> silly, silly trap, yeah? Okay, so slow death is a condition of being worn out by the activity of reproducing life. <coughs> Agency can be an activity of maintenance, not making, which I think is, a, is a, quite an important point. It can be fantasy without grandiosity. It can be sentience without full intentionality. It can be inconsistency without shattering. And it's about embodying alongside embodiment. Now, Boulogne is a queer critic. She probably hates being called that. But, um, but as someone, she draws our attention though to the theoretical richness, I think, of some contemporary queer criticism. She's Reworking notions of agency as so being somewhere between affect and cognition. Okay? And um, she's reworking agency as between intention and in intention, intentionality. Okay? Between materiality and immateriality. Um, whilst attending to the contemporary conditions of neoliberalism and our attachments to objects that prevent flourishing. Her book called Cruel Optimism, and um, basically, Cruel Optimism is about why do we become attached to the things that prevent prevent us flourishing as people. Like this whole we get you know we get caught up the notion of the good life, yeah, that we just do a bit more, just do a bit more. And then we become attached to the very things that stop us from flourishing in the first place. And and it's also about the times that we live in and these kind of the neoliberal conditions that we live in where people don't really know what to do. You know the reason we've got a turn to effect is because people don't know what to do anymore. So we've gone back to like some kind of Perhaps we might be driven by some unconscious feeling into a better way of life <laughs> because we've got no idea what to do. Yeah, so it's that kind of, those kinds of political contexts I think a lot of people are using that effect theory. Okay, so to pull this together. Um, towards a queer feminist approach for theorising the politics of embodiment. Okay, so I do, what I want to argue is that theorising the politics of embodiment requires engaging with feminist and queer theories beyond gender performativity and the identification of heteronormative practices. Okay? I've been arguing that for a long time, but I just I want to say it again. <laughs> um, theorising the politics of embodiment entails addressing what it means to queer health as well as queer bodies. Okay? Uh, so what might this approach look like? What might this queer feminist approach look like? And I am incredibly influenced here by people like uh, Ron Weidman, Ron Blount, etc. People who are kind of grappling with this thing about what is it to be in between paranoid and reparative readings. I'm not suggesting we get rid of paranoid readings, we only do 
how to read these. I'm, I'm kind of thinking about how can we use both techniques in the way that we work, methodologically, theoretically. So I think it does require us to rethink theories and methods and forms of interpretation. So, so what forms are we using in interpretation? How do we sense things? How do we uh, re-describe things? You know, those sorts of things. Uh, rather than just, you know, so I, I think we need to resist the pull of empowerment reading. Okay? Always empowerment reading. Which we end up reconstructing the binaries of what we were trying to deconstruct in the first place. I think we need then to do that is to seek to love and nurture our objects of study, even if it is neuroscience or biology. Yeah? So we have to give them a little bit of care to try to pull things out. And that's what I found really inspirational about Sedgwick, is that Sedgwick, you know, she used Sylvan Tompkins, social psychologist from the 1950s. She used, you know, she, you know, she used Melanie, goes back to Melanie Klein, and of course she's, she's having a crit there's a criticality in her engagements with them, but she's also loving them and caring them and asking what they can, what they're saying can actually help do. Yeah? So, so that kind of rather than things being good or bad or you know in or out, it's like what can we get from this? I think we in the process of doing this we have to bear ambivalence. I personally feel quite happy with ambivalence, but not everyone does. So, um, but also, and I think we also have to be able to bear the vagueness of materiality. And I think that's like, you know, we've seen for years, it's like, oh, what about materiality of this? What about, oh, what about it? You know, like, it's like, what, you know, like, the what about it is like, we're never going to really be able to explain it, it's more up to map it. We have to kind of bear the vagueness of it, yeah? Without kind of erasing it altogether. Um, and we have to attend to the condition of neoliberalism. These are the types that we live in. Uh, so we have to think about the condition of neoliberalism as it constitutes the politics and embodiment. You know, for example, one person, who gets to live a long life? Yeah. Um, and then I think we can do this by utilising some of these concepts which are coming out from queer perspectives, things like slow death, rather than the, cru um, the cruel optimism of the healthism uh, with its moralising and normalising discourses. Okay, thank you. <laughs>
yeah. this is yeah. a particular scene. So what's happening in the scene, and it's not just about construction of this, you know, that is embodied in each of I mean, I, one of the things I love about Eve Sedgwick is, you know, in some ways she is a psychologist because she says that we are all, into, you know, we are all different from one another. That's her first accident. People are different from one another, yeah? And it's like, so, so you know, that actually is, is important because it means that our, the specificity of our experiences will be you know, we have some shared commonalities, but there will be differences. Can I ask a question? In your um, kind of manifest, or I suppose at the end, but these are some of the things that we might want to look at. And you hinted at methods, and I know you've mm -hmm. used creative yeah. methods. Yeah. Do you have any suggestions or thoughts about how to grasp some of these other ways? Mm -hmm. Well, I like visual methods because I think it opens up different like, affective dynamics, I think. Mm -hmm. The problem is though is then when you try to interpret. So like, for me it's actually at the moment it's questions around interpretation. Mm -hmm. So how do we interpret? So, and then I find that maybe it's because of our training and my training, mm -hmm. but I find it really hard to shake off those post-structures criti critique mm -hmm. and you just want to quieten that voice sometimes and think, oh maybe I could, can I just <laughs> you know, so, so I think I think it's that you know a monster of social constructions to all the social constructions. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like and it's a, it's also about, but then uh, for me that feels like very easy to do. Mm -hmm. So actually, is there something else going on here? Can we pull things out in different ways? And I suppose for, so. Then I try to use different theories for thinking about interpretation. So what would psychoanalysis allow me to interpret from this? Or what you know, what would um, you know different forms of affect theory? Or, I mean, I'm, when I say psychoanalysis, I mean people like. Um, uh, Bracket Etty's work on the trick school, so it's like a feminist, yes, in the case of kind of engagement with stuff and asking, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, try to use her a bit. But I think, I think methods are about playing around and doing different things, really. mm -hmm. so and then seeing what happens. Yes, I think the worst thing with methods is when it becomes like you just know at the beginning and stuff. It's like mm -hmm. I was, and that, that's what I've done for a long time. People in the research group that I was, you know, look, yes. we just try different things and see what happens. Mm. So, yeah, how about writing a memory, or how about taking a picture, or how yeah. about painting something? Yeah. You know, yeah. how about being a photo? You know, yeah. just try different things. Yeah. You just end up with different problems. Yes, generally, generally, you're going to take it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. 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 yeah, I was wondering about the response of the things that the conference around the union activism and the kind of way I'm thinking you're talking about. Was the end and also actually showing a bit of academic activism. Yeah. So, and what the implications are maybe for trans activism and fat activism, this way of engaging that sort of beyond the point of this. What do you mean together or separately? What do you mean? Well, like, have you drawn out, you know, so you've drawn out some of the implications for both academic theory and research mm -hmm. methods, but I wonder if you thought about the yeah, yeah. implications for activism because activism can kind of get very biological and sensuous or mm -hmm. kind of. I mean, I haven't, I haven't, particularly in these, I have, I have I've just started work with a trans youth group yeah. um, around using creative methods to try to think about um, notions of like the shifts in classification systems, like like what does gender, because gender is for as an affect, so like what is this, you know, so we've started trying to work with them doing stuff around that. And I have done the LGBT mental health service using the photo exhibition. Which was a form of activism because it was a form of being represented in pride, so being in a large field surrounded by people on drugs and really, really drunk isn't the best place if you've got <laughs> mental health on this. So, so this was like, that was a, a form of putting out the stories out into a community. But I, I mean, I, th I think that, I don't know, I, I often think that activism kind of leads us really rather than that. So do you think some of the things you're drawing on here have all come from activism? Well, I think they are. I mean, this yeah. picture is, for me, it's like, it's really incredibly powerful. It just sort of, you know, it's just, it's that, you know, so I think, and in some ways that says much more than me talking for different <laughs> minutes. You know, it's, I think, you know, I think that there is a lot out there. And I, I, maybe our job is to try to make sense of it. If you go more into an academic position. So mm -hmm. try, how do we make sense of it? And I know other people try to move across the two. <laughs> Thinking about how frightened I feel about the young people now. I've got, I've got a daughter, mm -hmm. and it's just a lack of exposure that we get to the different bodies and the different types of bodies. And 
and how much exposure they get of the kind of, not damaging, but that's not the right word, but some of the media that they get exposed to is very powerful, and how little, I'm just thinking of my own experience of just how petrified I am of my child being raised into this society, which means that they um, make moral judgments without realising it. And I'm just thinking that we need to, sort of, like you say about activism, just how do we get to the young people before they get to, it's too bad. Well, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I, it's hard. To, we can talk about concern for young people, but I mean, we all take part in normalising discourses, whether we realise it or not. So, I guess it's, you know, if there are opportunities to unsettle things, mm -hmm. that's what we should be doing. Really. So, I back that up. Sorry, I'm back that up. Though. I've got a nearly 10 year old and she's come back from school and she's like, oh, I'm a little fat today, I'm a little fat in the hair. It's yeah. 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 We're in a nervous system. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, it's Is that different now from when you were young? I don't know if it's any different. Mm -hmm. I mean, like 1950s housewives were all about the country. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I'm not sure if it is any. Is it any. Is it any I think possibly the visual, the visual is, is, is just more there, isn't it? The social media provides that cruel optimism. Yeah. If only one could dress, one could end up looking like your friend on Snapchat. Mm -hmm. Or whatever it is that you use, you know. Yeah. I think there is some of that. Mm -hmm. I was just yeah. going to add to that about what you were saying, Helen, because you can't open a female woman's magazine without getting these kind of transformational stories about look at me then, yeah. look at me now. Yeah. I mean, some of them, you literally, all of them, you you know, you go on, they'll all be on the front pages. And, you know. Yes, yeah, I think it is still political because um, if you think of the notion of obesity, yes. it's now um, out there, that discourse by the government, that anyone fitting this certain category is obese, therefore you're wrong. So our children are picking up from this big controlling parent in the world saying, have you got now? You're no good. Got a bit of facts on you, therefore you're, you're not a good person. And they are picking up these discourses um, that are in the public consciousness because of government policies. And this is what's going on. I would say yes, children do definitely go through a stage where there's a lot of self-monitoring and comparing and picking up themselves and looking and certainly that there were quite a few of us measuring weights and doing this kind of thing. But none of us kind of thought we were wrong or bad, yeah. It wasn't that. It wasn't about that. But now it's about actually there's something intrinsically wrong with you because the government says no. And it really comes from a very high up place now. I don't know, I'm thinking, <laughs> I'm thinking about this. I think it's politics of control, though, isn't it? It's back now. It was smoking a decade ago, and before that, it was communism or it was witches. And <laughs> I'm not trivializing the concern with, with obesity, but it, it's, a, it's a phenomenon. It's a, it's a politics of control. It, it's a way of living society and keeping people behaving in particular kinds of ways and not in other kinds of ways. And I'm, whereas I, it's fascinating to, to look at the way this gets reproduced. I'm kind of interested in, in its resilience as a phenomenon, as a process, um, rather than in the target. And I've not done enough thinking about that, I think. <laughs> I don't know. Do you think about its form of biopolitics? Yeah, just about, <coughs> just about the, yeah, the kind of politics of control and how different things get kind of play, played into it. And now it is, now it is fat and health. That, that's the thing. Um, but it was something else. Um, and it will be something else at some other point. Yeah, so I remember and that crossing between smoking. Smoking is quite heavy smoking, mm -hmm. I'm sure a lot of you remember. And, but, um, but yeah. if we think yeah. of, we, um, like if we, we can all do the critique, but what, that, is there something like that with smoking and bannings, the bands of smoking and people smoking less, did that have, does that have a, a kind of impact? So it's the kind of, the, the thing is about the questions of health, isn't it? The focus on this, the normal <coughs> life, the, the, you know, like smoking reduces your life expectancy, obesity, you know, it's, the focus is on the health, not, you know, the, the not you the say, the the people, the whatever the thing is, is yeah. but it's the thing that yeah. up there and the fantasy yeah. that somehow we won't ever die. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or the rest of the version.
There is a we are all. I'd like to announce living in slow death. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. The longest work. Questions or comments? Right. Just remain centered, Sam Catherine, for a really inspiring and uh, 